Welcome everyone to our March Leadership Session. My name is Crystal Rowland. I'm the Director of Program Standards in the Office of Teaching and Learning. We're excited to have you with us today for our March Leadership Session. Um, these began back in 2019 as a way to share updates around standards, revision and review, as well as share resources to support implementing standards um, back in your districts and in your schools. Um, we want to thank WKEC for providing this space for us to come together today. We appreciate their partnership. Um, this is one of the times of year that we look forward to being able to visit each of the educational cooperatives around the state and meet with each of you in person. Um, we're here always to support you. Um, and a lot of times we receive emails or phone calls, but being able to meet with you in person and address your questions, there's just something that can't replace that. And so we look forward to this to connect with you um, and, and just share our information in person. So I wanna recognize our March leadership team. These folks work behind the scenes and in person uh, to help support and bring these to you. Um, with us today, we have Misty Higgins and Fox DeMoise. They are professional learning coordinators in the Office of Teaching and Learning. Uh, we also have with us our science consultants, Erica Baker and Amanda Pruitt, who will be sharing some resources around science today as well. So we appreciate them being here with us in person. Last year at our March Leadership Session, we talked about the importance of high quality instructional resources. And we know those are central to the, the experience for students and teachers in the classroom. Um, and they're so vital in really bringing to life the standards in the classroom. Today, you're gonna to get some information around curriculum-based professional learning, how to support teachers in really implementing those resources well, um, and really bringing to life the experience we would want to see from our standards in the classroom. We also have some information at the end, a standards update around science standards and some resources to support you, um, as well as some other other content area standards that are open for review. So at this time, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to Misty Higgins to lead us through the next section. Good morning, everyone. And I just wanna thank you all um, for having us here today. We um, have been on the March Roadshow to the different co-ops around the state, and we get to end with the best one. This is where we ended last year, and it was a beautiful day here last year. So something about the weather and when we're here, it's like always perfect, which is really nice. And I do just quickly want to give a shout out if we have anyone here from Lyon County. I know you guys just won the basketball state tournament, so congratulations. <laughs> And one thing I do want to say as we get going this morning that I think is important to acknowledge, today is about an awareness of some new resources that we have. And while you're going to get a taste of some of those resources, we do not have time in three hours to get in depth into them here in the, together today. And so we recognize a couple of things about this session. One, while we have built in multiple opportunities for you to get to talk, we're likely always going to pull you back before you're ready. Like you're going to want to keep talking and we know that and we also know that you're gonna have thoughts and questions and want to keep kind of digging into things but again it's about trying to let you know of the different resources we have what they do contain so we have built in multiple individual kind of reflection points for you to always after each section just jot down what is top of mind for me what's that note that I need to make to self of where I might pick this conversation back up when I get back to my district or that resource I want to make sure that I get back into so I just wanted to let you all know that today and we will leave contact information because a lot of times you're not even going to know the questions you have until you actually get into the work and start using resources back in your district so we will leave you with that and at the very end Fox is going to be talking about an ongoing opportunity that we have to walk alongside you to support you as you're implementing a reading and writing HQIR back in your district so just want you to know lots of support there but for today it really is about building an awareness around some new resources we have. And with that being said, in terms of the resources that you're going to need today, most of them are in a stack right in front of you because we know that as you start to look at things, it's good to have hard copies so you can make notes on them. I would like for you to please just double check that you do have all of the things you see on the screen and I'll walk you through them quickly. So at the very top of your stack, you should have had a participant handout. And that is just a place for you to capture your notes as you go through the, uh, the session today. Then underneath of that, you have three resources that we're gonna be taking a closer look at. 
The very first one, and this is the order we're going to look at them as well, is the curriculum implementation framework. Then the next one is two protocols that are stapled together. So the top one should say the reading and writing lesson internalization protocol. And just make sure stapled to it, it does have the lesson rehearsal protocol. So those two things together. Then the very last one is our newest resource, which is the structuring professional learning cycles. So please let us know if you're missing anything. And then you also received an email yesterday, and in that email there was a link to a participant folder. So if you don't mind, please have that up on your device. I want to point out just a few things that are in that folder. First of all, you're going to see, do you see the subfolder that's in there? Just know that those are digital copies of everything that you have in front of you right now, just in case you wanted access to uh, print those out later. So you've got the digital copies in that subfolder. Then you see three different documents on that landing page or that home page. One of them is called the Curriculum Based Professional Learning Guidance Document. That is a massive document, so we did not want to print that out, but I would like for you to please go ahead and open it up in its own tab on your computer because we're going to come back to that a little bit later today. So again, it's called the Curriculum Based Professional Learning Guidance Document. And again, just have it open in its own tab. So to get us going this morning, we are going to, in just a moment, engage in a class builder to get you up and moving around and talking to other people in the room. But to get ready for this class builder, you're going to notice on your table that there are stacks of quotes. There should be two stacks. It's one stack for each side of your table. We just didn't want anyone to have to read upside down. Now just a couple of notes about the quotes. They are all related to topics that we are going to be discussing today. And on several of the quotes, you're going to see the acronym HQIM. And just in case you're not familiar with that, that stands for high quality instructional materials. That's a term you hear nationally a lot. In Kentucky, just because of some language and law, we refer to them as HQIRs, high quality instructional resources, but those two terms are interchangeable. So what I'm going to ask you all to do is with your partner, you're going to spread the quotes out between the two of you. You're going to individually read through the quotes and you are going to select the quote that most resonates with you right now for whatever reason and just be prepared to share out why. Now, you each need your own quote. So if for some reason you and your partner want the same quote, please peacefully navigate that between the two of you so no one ends up with like a paper cut or anything. So I'm going to pause now, give you an opportunity to read and pick the quote that most resonates with you. And again, once you have yours selected, just stand up with that quote in hand so I know you're ready to move on. And as we're waiting on the last few people, one thing I would like to point out is all of the sources from where we got the quotes, they are on this slide, both like here in little tiny print. But when you get access to the slide deck, in a, you're going to get a follow-up email as soon as we finish today with the slide deck. In the speaking notes, we have them also listed for you. So here's what's going to happen. Since we are looking at all these quotes from different sources, we're calling this class builder just a coffee house chat. And the way it's going to work is when I say go, you are going to put a hand up. You're going to pair with the first person you come to, not at your table, and you're each going to just quickly greet each other and take a turn sharing the quote that you picked and why you picked it. Even if you both have the same quote, you, sh you could have picked it for different reasons, so make sure each person has a turn to share. Then thank your partner. Your hand goes right back up to find a new partner. You want to pair with as many people as you can before we call you back together. Ready? Go. <laughs> You two can, okay, yeah. And again, once you both have shared, thank each other, hand up new partner. <laughs> I think 
there's some people, ladies, I think there's some people this direction. Yep. do now is just spend a little time framing the big picture around MTSS and then narrowing down to where we're going to focus our time and attention today. In our roles as leaders back in our districts, one of the most important things that we can do is to create coherence across the school system. And we know that this can be challenging work because oftentimes we're trying to implement multiple initiatives, practices, and programs at the same time. And what can happen is that those things end up operating in isolation rather than complementing each other and your system as a whole. That is the entire purpose of MTSS. It does provide that overarching framework that allows you to create that system-wide coherence by organizing and aligning all the different multi-tiered supports that you have in place. So things like academic RTI, PBIS, and any other initiative to support student learning. Now, at the heart of an effective MTSS framework is that primary prevention for all students by providing those strong tier one supports in three areas. So academically, through the use of high quality instruction and resources, behaviorally, through the school-wide behavior expectations, and then social emotionally, through those social emotional competencies. And we can see the critical importance of that tier delivery system when you look at that visual of the six essential elements of MTSS, because you see that tier delivery system sits right at the center, at the heart of that framework. So for our purposes today, we are going to be looking at how we can strengthen our tier one academic instruction and what are those key systems and structures that need to be in place to support implementation of your strong local curriculum and HQIR in any content area. And that brings us back to this visual that we introduced at last year's March leadership meeting. And it shows the four key elements that are needed to help strengthen tier one instruction to provide that system-wide instructional coherence. Key element one is about having a common instructional vision in place for each content area. And that was one of the primary areas of focus at our March leadership meeting last year. With key element two, we also spent some time looking at that last year, but just in terms of the rationale for using high quality instructional resources to anchor that local curriculum. While adopting an HQIR is important, it in and of itself is not going to guarantee that your teachers and students have true access to those resources and that they are being used in a way that's gonna provide that high quality instruction for all students, leading to an improvement in the student experience and outcomes. So what we're gonna be doing today is looking at what do we mean by true access to the strong local curriculum and HQIRs. We also see the uh, need for HQIRs included in the Kentucky Board of Education's call to action document that outlines the board's priorities. So please take a moment, read the excerpt from that document you see on the slide in regards to access to HQIRs. Thank you. 
So kind of the question for the day is what does effective integration of these resources look like and what are the things that are needed to be in place to support that implementation? And that brings us to our purpose for today. So in terms of our learning goal, we're going to be uh, learning about effective implementation of a local curriculum supported by HQIRs. We have divided our learning time into three sections today. So in the first section, we are going to be looking at a roadmap to support effective curriculum implementation, looking at the different stages and the key responsibilities by role group across each stage. In section two, we're going to deepen our understanding of what is meant by curriculum-based professional learning and what are the PL experiences needed to support curriculum implementation. And then section three, what we will end with is our informational portion of the day. So that's where we're going to give you an update on some new resources we have to support local implementation of the CAS for Science, as well as letting you know where we are with the visual and performing arts standards, as well as the health and PE standards. So that last part will be informational. So I would like for each of you just to think, if this is our focus for today, the learning that we are bringing to you, given your role and the focus back in your school or district, what might be a goal that you could set for yourself? And you're gonna see at the very top of your participant handout, there's a space that says my goal for you to jot down a goal that you can set for yourself today. So I'm gonna pause give you just a little bit of some think time and writing time to jot down a goal that you could set for yourself. Again, right at the top of your participant handout. Take just another moment to finish writing that goal. And here's what we would like for you to do. At your tables, we're going to ask you to do a single round robin. Each person is going to take a turn, and when it's your turn, we would like for you to share your name, your role, and then the goal that you jotted down. You can start with the person that is closest to me right now and then just go clockwise around your table until each person's had a turn to share. Ready? Go. We're going to work now through this first section. We're going to be taking a look at a framework to support effective curriculum implementation. And our objective is we're going to take a look at the curriculum implementation framework um, and, and its intention is to really give you a role-based view of what are the key responsibilities that need to be undertaken as implementation um, unfolds. So we'll see what are, what are those leadership actions that need to be undertaken by district leaders, by building leaders, by teachers, and then we'll look all the way down to the student experience, what responsibilities they have and how they're impacted. Before we do that, however, um, if you were able to be with us last year, we spent some time establishing a rationale for why HQIR's high quality and instructional resources matter. And we did that through the lens of looking what, at what the research has to say about the adverse effects of what happens um, in the learning environment when teachers and students do not have access to high quality instructional resources. 
because that understanding and rationale is really important. We want to reset it today, but we're going to do so a little bit differently and hopefully in a fresh fashion. So we're going to look at what does the research say can happen, those positive effects of when teachers and students do have access to HQIRs and they're implemented effectively. We're also going to see some of the positive things that are enabled when access is there across Kentucky um, with our pilot districts and even with some of the work we're doing less formally um, statewide. So we're going to see the impacts fall into two primary buckets. Um, impacts on teachers and the quality of instruction, impacts on students, the student experience, and student outcomes. So we're going to start first with two from the national research, and I'll give you a little bit of individual sense-making time, and then I'll add in some commentary. We'll just sort of work through the slides that way. So here are two from the national research. <clears throat> As Misty said earlier, you'll notice in that tiny white font, there's the citation information if you're curious when you get the deck. Uh, in that first one, we, we immediately see the mingling of what HQIR does to the quality of instruction and does for teachers and then how that directly impacts um, student achievement and student outcomes. Um, in the second, we see that HQ and R, HQIR enables a uh, more consistent activation of those disciplinary practices. Now here we're looking at the math practices, um, but this would really hold for HQIRs across content areas because of that consistent, intentional, research-based um, design that they have and because of their regular embrace of disciplinary practices. So students engaging more in the practices, the deep practices of the disciplines, really is going to support deeper learning as well. So we ha we've had three pilots thus far. We had a two-year reading and writing pilot where we, we, worked, with a dis we worked with Kentucky districts through um, identifying, selecting, and evaluating HQIRs and then, or an, a primary HQIR, um, and then supporting them in that first year of implementation. We're in the second year of a math pilot and the first year of a science pilot doing same, the same work in those content areas. So here are some of the trends that we're seeing from the pilot districts that we've worked with, but we're also seeing these trends uh, with other districts that we've partnered with a little less formally. So here is the teacher side. So when we looked at the, re the research around uh, what happens when teachers don't have access to HQIRs and they're spending an inordinate amount of time scrambling around to create or curate their own materials, um, we, see the, we saw the impacts that that has on instruction. When teachers have access to HQIR and, and they're freed up to really dig into the resources it makes available, they're going to be able to better engage their students and better differentiate to meet their individual needs. Um, we also know that for the quality of instruction to change, um, teachers' beliefs sometimes have to evolve as well. Um, and, and like the rest of us, teachers really need to experience something, many of them, for beliefs to change. And as teachers are seeing students across demographics in their classrooms engaging in rigorous grade level work, um, their beliefs about what's possible for kiddos, what students can, can ultimately know, understand, and be able to do is starting to shift. And we know from the research that teacher expectations for students has a significant effect size all its own. So we're really starting to see teachers' beliefs about what's possible for kiddos starting to shift as it's happening in their classrooms. Here are two from the student side. <clears throat> For reading and writing folks in the room with us today who are familiar with the science of reading research around comprehension and how building background knowledge supports the comprehension of students, it's probably not surprising that the background knowledge building that HQIRs tend to do across the content areas is going to enable all students to uh, better engage with grade level learning. Um, and we see it just like with comprehension, those effects are going to be most pronounced 
with our kiddos who need it the most. So the kids who are most enabled by that background knowledge tend to be those you know, from lower SES who've had less exposure to it. On the second one, I can add anecdotally um, that the happy stories we're hearing coming back from district leadership and building leadership and even from some teachers on our site visits of kiddos coming home really enthused about the learning that's happening in their classrooms and wanting to talk at the dinner table about books they're reading and things they're doing, which obviously is, is fantastic, that sort of engagement um, and energy coming around um, their access to HQIR. So last spring, to close out the reading and writing pilot, um, we, the districts convened and we had a celebration session. Um, and beforehand, they curated what were some of the high points for them during that two-year pilot. And then we went back to their slides and pulled out um, some excerpts, a smattering of what districts had to say. So I'll let you take a look at those. Pretty broad range of positive effects. Um, and if that last little bullet at the bottom caught your interest. So in, we know in, in big data world, um, it can take three plus years and tends to for the, the impacts of something as, as big in scope as HQIR for those positive effects to fully be realized. And yet even earlier than that in the data, we're starting to see some positive trends in the state level data. Um, including movement with novice reduction um, and move it, movement among targeted subpopulations. So that's fantastic, but we're also seeing students who have traditionally be high uh, students who have traditionally been high performing exhibiting additional growth as well. And we know for those kiddos, additional growth for them can be really hard to get at, and that's happening too. Again, even early in the data. Um, and as we have conversations with districts and they talk to us about their internal data, there's some pretty positive shifts happening there as well. We're not gonna do a super deep data dive into this slide, but this is a screenshot from RAND's AIR survey, the American Institutes for Recovery survey. And this is looking at standards aligned materials usage for mathematics in Kentucky. That's kind of a mouthful. Um, so the SAUC is for standards alignment. It's looking at the, the, the use rates of standards aligned materials in mathematics. So I'll give you a second to. Even at a glance, three things you may have noticed. Um, one, there's, there's, some differences in use, there's some differences in usage rates across the grade bands. Um, maybe a little bit of a surprise. Um, we're, we'd probably notice that there's a correlation between districts and schools requiring or recommending HQIR use and the rate of usage that's happening. Um, and then the third one we might call attention to is that high end looks at 75% or more of instruction. We're gonna see as we dig further into the research today and do some learning around this, that for HQIR to really maximize its impacts on the quality of instruction, the student experience and student outcomes, that usage rate is going to be probably closer to 90% to really get at those transformative effects. So this is, this is same, same survey data set, but now we're looking at um, reading and writing in the standards aligned material, materials usage in reading and writing. Comparatively, you might notice a little bit of difference between reading and writing and math, those two content areas, some of the other trends hold the same. Um, so I'm, a, I'm an ELA guy, I'm not gonna be coming at you with too many equations today, but I think one simple way we could sort of boil this down as we really think together about what constitutes adequate or effective usage of HQIR would be effective use really can be thought about as the quality of usage. And we'll hear language like um, implementing with integrity or fidelity and the quantity of usage where we'll hear language like consistency or frequently and that high quality plus high quantity I think is going to add up to being effective overall. 
Okay, so that was a lot coming at you there on those slides. Um, a little bit from the national scene, some of what's happening in Kentucky. So if you will, um, just at your table with a partner, we'll have a simple turn and talk. So what's really top of mind for you or some overarching thoughts or ideas or questions that may have come up just from those last few slides. So take a couple minutes and just talk with a shoulder partner. So we're not gonna call back to last year too many more times. Um, but again, if you were able to be with us, we spent a good bit of time talking about the curriculum development process. And we left that off last year looking at phase four of the CDP. And phase four was, is really all about planning and preparing for implementation and the professional learning that needs to happen there. And as helpful as it might be to have those planning tools, we recognized pretty quickly that Kentucky districts needed tools that they could have in hand as they're actually doing the work of implementation across the years of implementation. So that launched us into about a year or 18 months worth of research, conversation with some of our national partners, some collaboration with other state departments of education. Um, and the result of all of that was the understandings that we came to and some of the tools that we're gonna have a chance to look at today. So this first little bit, we're really gonna be thinking about implement, the implementation of side of things, and then we'll get into the professional learning that needs to accompany that here in a bit. So one of the first things we had to figure out, and this is a slide that we adapted from Rivet Education, one of the first things we had to figure out was, in our Kentucky context, how many stages are we seeing implementation uh, being broken into? And some of the national models we looked at had as few as three, which is where we landed, up to as many as six. Um, and, and looking to try to be as simple as possible, we felt like we could fold in some of, the, some of the nuance of what happens in that refinement and sustainability stage into the single stage of ongoing. So we ended, we ended up with three. Launch is typically planning and preparation and what happened prior to and then just as you're implementing that new resource. Um, and you notice the little blue arrow there, so you have to have a plan in place to, to launch again the following year if you have teachers that are new to the district or changing content areas. How do we have that as a recurring thing that we can, we can shuffle folks into? Early implementation tends to be academic year one, but we're seeing more and more in Kentucky and nationwide that early implementation sort of creeping well into academic year two just because there's so much going on there. Uh, and early implementation is about building that overall understanding of the instructional model and design of your resource, um, the scope and sequence, and then how all of that is inflected at the unit level and then at the lesson level. Um, and also getting some of those core processes up and running. So if you can get all of that done in, in early implementation, however long that takes you, pretty solid. So then ongoing is where we move into with that foundation established, building toward greater sustainability and refinement and really ta tailoring to the particulars of our local context. So you're gonna see these three stages consistent across the resources we look at today. And that takes us to the first one, the Curriculum Implementation Framework, which again was published earlier this year. Um, and it really is intended to provide a roadmap of those key responsibilities according to role group. So two things you'll notice when we get into it here in a moment are, if you look left to right, you'll notice the actions of each group enabling those to the right of them. So district leadership actions enabling building leadership and so on. As you work sort of vertically through the document, you'll notice a degree of gradual release as teacher capacity um, and some of that is, some of the work is released to teacher leadership. Now there's always plenty, you know, on the district and building leaders' plates, but you will see teachers being able to take up um, parts of this work that are appropriate to them. So to get you into it, we're going to do an activity that will that'll allow us um, entry through a particular lens. So where we're being specific about a content area, we're going to just default to reading and writing today because so many districts will be implementing a new reading and write, writing resource in the fall. So thinking about reading and writing, you're gonna look at either launch or early. So we're gonna pick one of two stages. If you are getting ready to launch a new resource and begin to implement in the fall, go ahead and do launch. If you're in early implementation of a resource now, um, or early was the most recent stage for you, whether it was last year or a little early or a little before that, there is benefit in going back. So with reading and writing, as your lens and looking at a particular stage, launch or early, whichever's best for you, notice which of the actions there have been, have been done in your local context. You can check those, circle those, smiley face them, whatever you wanna do. Which of those may have only been partially done at this point? And then which may be some that for one reason or another have not been done yet. 
Um, and as, we, as our sense of what happens in implementation ex expands, there are going to be things that all of us um, didn't have happen for one reason or another. So on your hard copies, marking that up how, however works for you, will take about seven minutes or so and just work through either launch or early. And this is going to be a first exposure to this tool for many of you, so don't feel pressured to parse too closely. We're as much building familiarity as we really are. If we're in year three, we would go ahead and do the ongoing grind. It, it might be helpful to still go ahead and take a look back at the early. early mm -hmm. Make sure we covered it all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, if chronologically you would find yourself in ongoing, it still might be helpful to go back and take a look at early just to see what you see in hindsight. <laughs> Three more minutes, and then we'll have an opportunity to move and discuss. So we're going to have a chance, as I said, to move around a little bit and also have some fresh conversation with somebody we may not have had a chance to speak to yet today. So we're going to use a stand-up, hand-up, pair-up. If everybody will stand up, and if you want to get hold of your marked-up framework in one hand, if everybody will stand up, put a hand up. And then find a partner, maybe somebody you didn't speak with during the coffee house chat, or you can come back to a familiar face if you'd like to. But everybody, we'll go ahead and stand up, hand up, pair up. Take your framework with you, please. <clears throat> Okay, so coming back real quick, I even saw some enthusiastic high-fiving happen. It feels good that it's Friday. Uh, so we're just going to use a rally robin to structure this conversation. So it's kind of volleying back and forth, just what we're, what we're noticing is that you had, maybe questions that might have arisen. Um, if you had any ideas for next steps, you can just sort of work in and out of those three, going back and forth with the talk turns, and we'll take about two or three minutes. So we'll go ahead and talk in our conversations. If you need to trio up, if you're looking for partners, go ahead and you can be a trio as well. Okay, we'll take about two or three minutes. All right, so if you will, again, thank your partner or partners, plural, for the conversation. And then we'll start to make our way back to our seats. <laughs> So as you all are transitioning, I heard kind of an even distribution. There were, there were some definite celebrations of successful steps. Um, there were some acknowledgement of challenges that folks are still trying to wrestle with and figure out. Um, there was some identification of, of what seemed like critical next steps, so sort of a mix in what I was able to hear moving around. Something we're going to do throughout the segments today to allow you to personalize your takeaways is just going to be having a few minutes for individual synthesis. So it's a spot for you to take whatever might be moving around in your head from the last segment and make some sense of it 
um, on your paper. So we'll take about a minute or two here, and on page one of your participant handout, what's top of mind for you right now, having looked at a, a stage of the framework, had some conver conversation around it, what's top of mind for you? So on your participant handout, page one, take a minute or two for individual synthesis. And this is just for you, so feel free to be as short, sweet, or formal or informal as you like. So from the perspective of your role, having gotten into the framework a little bit, what's top of mind for you right now? Bless you. <clears throat> because this is new terrain for, for many of us, for most of us, um, we're going to close each segment with some recommendations. So moving forward, a recommendation would be to use the framework um, and we'll talk about the ways it can be used to really optimize um, implementation in order to, to get the effects that we're looking to have um, for teachers and for students. So that might look like using the framework as a planning tool, using it diagnostically as a self-assessment, using it as a way to inventory and identify where more support or coaching might be needed. So there's a variety of uses there. Um, something we would also call out, and I heard things in this direction um, a couple times in the conversation today, it is okay if you realize your outcomes are not being met or some of your goals are not being met that you have for implementation to hit the pause button and even rewind a little bit and re-implement if necessary. Um, and this tool can be helpful diagnostically. If you're not getting the outcomes that you hope for and you recognize in the framework um, something or some things that may have been missed that could be helpful, feel free to go back and pick those up and incorporate them in. Um, we're, we're seeing that in Kentucky, and we're also seeing that nationally. Um, and, and, and in both settings, one of the things we're seeing is if something was adopted without that instructional visioning work that we talked a lot about last year happening, um, going back, convening a curriculum team, and getting an instructional vision together, and really having that clarity, what do we value when it comes to teaching and learning in a particular content area, and then having that really be the driver of what happens forward from there can be a worthwhile step. So, we're now going to move into section two, where we want to look at the role of curriculum-based professional learning in supporting effective implementation. And we have four objectives for this section. So, one, we want to explore the characteristics of curriculum-based professional learning, really thinking about how is this different than the typical or traditional PL of the past. We want to identify the PL experiences that are needed to support each stage of implementation. We want to give you an opportunity to examine a couple of key tools um, and how those tools, and then talk about how those tools can really support high quality instruction for all students. And then finally, at the end, we're going to close this section out with looking at a possible way that you might structure curriculum based professional learning at the local level. And so, reframing where we are. So again, looking at the curriculum development process, everything in today's session is really looking to support phase four, which is implementing and monitoring that curriculum over time. And as you can see, step two of phase four is providing ongoing high quality professional learning. And like Fox said, we've really spent the last year to 18 months uh, creating additional supports and a lot of them are right here on the uh, providing that high quality professional learning. Going back to the visual for strengthening tier one instruction, we see that providing ongoing high quality professional learning is key element three. And I think one important point to make is that um, it truly does serve as the linchpin between key element two and key element four. Because if you do not provide the ongoing high quality professional learning to your educators, then you're not going to get out of that HQIR what you think that you can get out of it. You've got to have the high quality professional learning so that teachers are providing the high quality instruction to get to that improved student experience and outcomes. 
We also see the importance of high quality professional learning included in the Board of Education's call to action document. And as you can see on this slide, it calls for high quality professional learning that engages educators in deeper learning experience that essentially mirror those that we're expecting them to provide to the students. And so when we think about professional learning and just our own kind of experiences, we probably have experienced some good professional learning and some not so good professional learning. So I want you to take a moment and read the quote that you see there on the slide. <coughs> I see a lot of head shakes around the room. We have all likely experienced PD that did not meet our needs as a teacher and maybe felt really disconnected from what was actually happening in the classroom. So just based on your own experiences, I want you to think about what are some ways that typical or traditional PD tends to fall short of meeting teachers' needs. So I'm going to pause, just give you a little bit of individual think time. So again, what are some ways that typical or traditional PD tends to fall short of meeting teachers' needs? So just get a few ideas in mind. And then at your tables, we would like for you to just have a, a team discussion, sharing out some ways that came to mind in terms of how traditional PD falls short of meeting teachers' needs. Please just remember to equitably share that airtime. So have that conversation now. Start to wrap up those conversations. And I heard a lot of really great ideas as I was walking around. Some common ones that I heard shared out how PD is often one and done and there's no real follow-up support for teachers and also how it's often not content specific so it's left up to the teacher to figure out how to transfer it back to the classroom setting. And while all of those are absolutely true, you uh, might be surprised by what a recent study highlights as to what teachers are saying they most need when it comes to professional learning. So in a new annual research brief from Rivet Education, 96% of the teachers surveyed said the number one factor they want leaders to consider when planning professional learning was whether or not it would help them to use their resources effectively. Now this points to a very specific type of high quality professional learning, something that is called curriculum based professional learning. And you all know how we love us some acronyms in education, so no surprise we got an acronym for this. So curriculum based professional learning is often referred to as CBPL. You're going to see that on the slides as we move forward and you'll hear Fox and I starting to use that acronym as well. So again, curriculum based professional learning, CBPL. So returning to the results from the recent RAND survey, again, that was given to teachers here in Kentucky, this slide is looking at another question that they were asked. So they were asked to report the amount of time that they spent in professional learning focused on helping them use their instructional resources. And it specifically was asking them to report how much time they spent doing that type of PL in their coaching, in their collaborative learning, and in workshops. So I'll pause and give you a moment to take in that slide. On a positive note, do see that teachers in Kentucky reported spending more time in professional learning focused on using their instructional resources in 2023 as compared to 2022. So that is a great trend that we are starting to see here in Kentucky. But because the concept of curriculum based professional learning is so new, not only here in Kentucky, but really nationally as well, understanding what these actually look like in the context of CBPL is probably pretty limited at this point. So what we want to do is to spend some time building clarity around what do these structures 
actually look like in the context of curriculum-based professional learning, and what are the PL experiences that need to be occurring within each of those that's going to support teachers in effectively using their resources to provide that high-quality instruction to all students. And so to help build that clarity, we've spent a lot of time developing what we are calling the curriculum-based professional learning guidance document. Now this guidance document consists of two main sections. The introduction is going to look at how KDE is defining curriculum-based professional learning, as well as the enabling conditions that are needed to support it. The second section is going to examine the three stages of curriculum-based professional learning, and for each stage, it's going to outline the PL experiences that are needed to support, as well as key questions and key tools to help you with implementation. Um, so what we are going to do right now is in just a moment, we're going to get into that guidance document. But first, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge the partners that helped in the development of this guidance document. From our in-state partners of the pilot districts and the educational cooperatives to the, dish, uh, the uh, national partners that you see listed on the slide. So this is one of the documents that I asked you earlier to please open up in its own tab on your computer. So before I give you your purpose for reading and where you're gonna be reading, go ahead and open up your device, have the curriculum-based professional learning guidance document in front of you. If for any reason your device is not playing nicely with you, you can scan the QR code and it'll bring the document up on your phone. And what I would like for you to do is scroll down to page four. So we're trying to build an understanding of what is curriculum-based professional learning. How is it different from traditional or typical PD? So we're going to start by looking at how KDE is defining it. So here's what I'm going to ask you all to do. On page four, do you all see the box near the top? You're going to start your reading at the paragraph below that box. And then if you'll scroll down to page five, do you see how there are like two sentences at the top of page five before it goes into the next section? You're gonna stop after you read those two sentences. You will also need your participant handout because this is your purpose for reading. As you read on page one of your participant handout, you're gonna see that there is a space for you to make note of characteristics of curriculum-based professional learning that are standing out as potentially most significant to you. That's kind of helping you wrap your head around what we mean by this. So I'm gonna give you all just three to four minutes to read and to capture that thinking on your handout. I think it's one thing to read about something, but it's another to get to kind of watch what it might look like in action to get a better sense of it. So what we're gonna do here in just a moment, we are gonna watch a video. This video was released at the Learning Forward Annual Conference back in December. Um, at that conference, one of the main themes from their pre-conference sessions through the three days of the actual conference was curriculum-based professional learning. The video we're about to see is gonna show you some of the aspects of curriculum-based professional learning. The main narrator is Jim Short. He is co-author of the book, Transforming Teaching Through Curriculum-Based Professional Learning that he co-wrote um, with Stephanie Hirsch. And so they really are some of the experts in this particular area. So what I'm gonna ask you all to do, as you watch this video, it's about eight minutes long, I want you to continue to make note of characteristics that are standing out as potentially most significant to you in that same space on your participant handout. Learning begins when you're a small child and you start to experience the world and make meaning out of those experiences. For many years in science, we have been trying to focus more on inquiry-based learning, where kids are exploring questions and trying to make sense out of things and developing evidence-based explanations. Okay, one thing I noticed, um, the actin kind of surrounded the myosin. Like Can in you the, explain? Like in the picture, like the actin was like this and then the myosin was in the middle. Oh, and then it had like all the branches. I guess we could say that. And that's a different way of teaching. It's a way of teaching that can be used in social studies and English and math. It's not unique to science. The classroom that you could walk into today and see this might look kind of chaotic. It might look noisy because kids are working and talking in groups and discussing. But I don't see a teacher up front, you know, presenting information. Three and a half minutes left for you to make sure you're meeting and looking at every single source. 
So we're asking teachers to potentially teach in a way that's very different than the way they've taught in the past and maybe even different than how they've even learned themselves when they were in school. And so you kind of ask yourself, how can I teach in a way that I've never experienced as a learner? Well, one of the ways to address that is to give teachers the opportunity to experience that kind of learning. And if it's actually the same experiences that the students are going to do in the curriculum, then it's helping build confidence of not only what it feels like to learn this way, but now I see what my role is going to be when I'm facilitating that same kind of learning with students. We know the candy has what in it? Palm oil. Palm or palm oil. Palm oil. So is there a connection to my candy now? Yes. Okay, and that connection is, what did you say it was? It's the palm oil. Just the palm oil, all right. Because that's an ingredient? Yes. Okay. And so just as students make meaning out of their experiences, teachers need to experience this kind of teaching so they can make meaning out of it to understand what it means for them to teach this way. Well, is it a before and after? Oh, that's a, Do you think like the top one's before and the second one's after the steroids? Um, I have for wonders, what is this, like a gallon diet? It kind of looks like it's on steroids, like just slightly. It's either on steroids or it actually has a lot of are, are fat. they male? This type of experience that is anchored in the instructional materials teachers will use with their students is referred to as curriculum-based professional learning. The design features and enabling conditions for curriculum-based professional learning offer a framework to plan and execute this transformative approach to professional learning. By us being in student hat and the facilitator being the teacher, now I'm able to see that. So it's not the facilitator just saying, oh, at this point you bring up these talk moves and you ask these questions. He or she is really modeling. How are you going to get this group of adults who know what they're doing to that next step? And that's something I can apply to my own students to get them to that next step. What do people think about bigger cells? Take a look around. Do we have agreement on that? No. No. So I'm going to add a question mark for bigger cells. Bigger cells, maybe. If you hadn't experienced the curriculum in professional learning, you wouldn't know that. You would just kind of want to fix everything right at the moment as opposed to trust the process, trust the curriculum. Okay, I know my kids are having difficulty now, but they'll work it out. I know that there's future lessons, there's other things we're going to do. They're going to help all the things come together. Curriculum-based professional learning is new. I found in traditional professional learning, your purpose was to learn one part of a lesson or one particular thing. In curriculum-based professional learning like this, you're learning the entire picture. You're seeing start to finish, how a curriculum plays out. So you now have a bit more confidence to be able to bring this back into your classroom and be able to get your students from that start through the process to the end. Now remember, let's add our questions at the bottom because our question is, what caused this buff fish to be so much bigger than the typical fish? It takes more time for teachers to engage in the learning experiences like students would and then reflect on it in a teacher mode. We often start with the first unit and then say you're on your way, go forth and prosper. We wouldn't teach students that way. Every unit deserves some level of professional learning to help teachers uh, continue to go deeper into understanding how the curriculum is put together, but also to learn the content more deeply and the challenges of that particular unit and not expect teachers to figure it out on their own. Right. And now we've added the variation of medium muscle. Right. And so... And is there a clear boundary between any of those labels? No, there's no. Not. I mean, there's one more extreme than the other. Right. But in terms of that variation, it's we were, like, it's super subjective. Yes. And, and we were saying there might be some students that might have a tough time with that. Yeah. And that's fine. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is, this is real, right? Like, mm -hmm. we're not... It's not... We're not cherry picking the data to look one way or the other. This is this is reality, and that's why I think this is this works so well because there's a, there is a lot of gray area in there. Another thing that this kind of professional learning requires is skilled facilitation, because the facilitators are not just creating a learning experience for the teachers; they're actually also modeling what their role is going to be when they move into the classroom and teach this way. We have these questions. What do we need to do or have information uh, that will enable us 
to begin answering those questions. So the facilitators will ask you, tell me more. What do you mean? Could you explain that differently? You're embedded, you're practicing, you're as a student seeing what you can see as the teacher. So it's neat to be in that opposite role. I've been teaching for 19 years, I teach seventh and eighth grade. You're always learning as a teacher, but having the facilitators being able to break it down and have you practice it. And then having a PD after a PD after a PD so you can come back and say, okay, well, I've done this. How do I do that? There's something about feeling what it feels like as a learner. Noticing where the discovery moments are for yourself so you can really make that happen for the kids as well. In education, we're really good at picking really innovative approaches. We're not always good at supporting the implementation of those approaches. And so there needs to be somebody in a leadership position who can continue to make sure that teachers have the time and the resources and the support. Um, teachers need to know that it's a safe environment to make some mistakes because this isn't going to be easy the first time. And so a leader that creates that opportunity for, for a safe space for the teachers to learn to get better at this kind of teaching is really important. If I were to have a discussion with administrators within my district, I would tell them that the biggest shift that I have seen in my teaching career over the course of the last 35 years has been with the opportunity to be in a professional learning environment that has been ongoing, that has been with a community of learners, and that has had the greatest effect on any shift in teaching that I have had. I really believe that without this ongoing curriculum-based professional learning, I would not have been as successful in my classroom because it's been a really big shift in how I teach my students and how my students learn and where they came from and where I want them to go. So what I want to do now is to give you all an opportunity to process what you read and what you saw in the video. So when I say go, this is what I would like for you to do. I want you to stand up, put a hand up, and trio up. So you're going to join up with two other people. You will need to take your participant handout and something to write with with you. When you get in your trio, greet each other, and then wait for me to give you further directions once I see everyone's made it into a trio. Go. And once you have your trio, help other people find their trio. I see some hand, right here, the three of you, if you want to go together. We've got a trio right there, right there. we got a group of four right there. Okay. Trying to make sure, is there anyone not in a trio? I think I've got a group of four back here and that's perfectly okay. I just wanted to make sure we don't have any other groups. Okay, here's what I would like for you all to do. I want you to do a continuous round robin where you're just gonna take turns sharing out things that you noted as potentially most significant in helping you understand the characteristics of curriculum-based professional learning. It's one idea per turn. You just keep going around and around until I call time. To see who's going to start, decide who has on the springiest looking colors today. <laughs> All right, if that is you, you're going to start, go clockwise from there, one idea per turn. Go. start to wrap up those conversations. And then let's come back together. I would like to do just a little bit of some whole group share out. So what were some things maybe that really resonated with you personally? Maybe some things that were common around your trio that you were sharing out. But what were some things you all noted in terms of characteristics of curriculum based professional learning? It's ongoing and job embedded. Yes, ongoing job embedded. And I think you'll see as we get more into this, like the role of the PLC in really supporting a lot of this. Other things that stood out. 
And I'll go back to that ongoing where he said every unit deserves some level of professional learning. And that really resonated with me in watching that video. Other things that stood out. I think there's so much power behind active modeling. Mm -hmm. So what I might interpret from the lesson plan might be totally different than Amanda. And so when we're modeling it, we can truly see yes. what is a benefit, what do we need to focus on instead of speaking the surface. Yep. And we all know we, we often need a vision of what something looks like to effectively implement it, but we haven't always been so good in the past of helping teachers see the vision of what it should look like, and that modeling helps. Someone else was about to say something, too. Yes, coaching is a big support in this and going connecting the two things that you all said, skilled facilitation. Did you pick up on that? Like developing skilled facilitators that could lead that for the teachers. Yes. And recognizing that not all districts are building have, building have instructional coaches. Mm -hmm. you think of coaching more as, as like a support function um, and who could inhabit that role. It could be yeah. the teacher, it could be yeah. an administrator, but coaching as a support doesn't always have to come from a designated instructional coach. Anything else? The one thing that I, every time I see this video that most resonates with me that I'll just point out quickly is when um, he talked about how any HQIR you get, they embody the instructional shifts we've been wanting teachers to make for quite some time. But just we had to give them something that would help them see how to make those instructional shifts that are inherent within our standards and what we're looking for in the student experience. But when we give teachers an HQIR that has these instructional shifts, they have probably never taught in that way before, nor did they learn that way. So as a former high school biology teacher, I can tell you I was never taught science in that way. So acknowledging for our teachers what we're asking them to do and understanding that's going to require some different professional learning to help get them there. Just adding one thing there, um, if we take science, for example, those instructional shifts, I mean, it makes sense that teachers might struggle to really design those into the learning that they're developing themselves, and so they may not have happened. If those are already designed into the resource yep. they're using, not only does that take that design barrier away, yep. but it also sort of locks you into really having to figure out, all right, this is, this is my curriculum, how do I make these instructional shifts as well, which is good that it requires support. So here's what we're actually going to ask you all to do. We're going to do a transition. You're going to stay with this trio just for our next task, and then you're going to be able to go back to your seats for the rest of the session. So bear with us for just a little bit. And here are your directions. We want you to find a place to sit with your trio. You can spread out in the room wherever you would like. You do need a hard surface to write on, though. So just want to point that out. And again, you need your participant handout and something to write with. When your trio finds a place that you would like to sit, I would like for one person from your trio what we've done is the next reading, we actually just printed a copy of the excerpt from the guidance document to make it a little bit easier. You're going to get one copy of the reading for each person in your trio or foursome if you have a foursome. Ready? Go. Okay. As you all settle into your new trio spots, um, just being sensitive to the teacher experience, something that's implied in the video but it doesn't get a chance to be called out directly is as they're going through this curriculum-based professional learning, they're not just learning how to deliver a curriculum. They really are having a chance to grow their instructional craft through this experience. And, and, and they're going to grow as educators in ways that would that, you know, that extend irrespective of what curriculum they're using. Because we know for our educators, the, the quality of their practice matters to them. And if they feel like, not only am I getting better at this curriculum, but I'm growing through the experience of it, you know, that matters. Okay, so as we come back to this slide, it's identical here, except for across the top, we're gonna to be thinking about what is the curriculum-based professional learning associated with each of our three stages. 
And we're going to do that through working through the stages of the guidance document itself. So for each stage, and you all just have an excerpt here, but we'll get a completed sense in a moment. For each stage, you're going to find a description of the stage, which gives a, sort of an overview of what's happening, the outcomes, some of the logistical information. And then sandwiched in the middle of that description will be a bulleted list of what are the PL experiences um, appropriate to that stage. For that stage to reach its outcomes, what are the PL things that need to be happening? So here we have a screenshot of stage two early implementation. We're going to explore the three stages in our trios in a jigsaw. So if you will, go ahead and quickly figure out who's going to be person one uh, launch, person two early, person three ongoing. If your trio is in fact a quad, um, person four can choose whichever stage you want to double up on, double up on that suits you. Okay, so on those excerpt of copies, we're going to, whichever stage you landed on, we're gonna annotate that stage. Um, if you wanna make some notes, just generally, what's your overall sense of the stage, so you can communicate that to um, your trio mates that didn't get a chance to look at that stage. But then our focus is gonna be, how does your stage and the PL experiences within it really support effective implementation of a curriculum? So we're going to go ahead and annotate whichever stage you have. Overall things you might notice, so you can, you, can, you can communicate those. But then how does your stage really support effective implementation of a local curriculum? And we'll take about four minutes to work up each of the stages. Looks like most are ready. So when you are ready, we'll start with person one and launch. Um, as you're hearing about each of the stages that you didn't get a chance to read, there's space on the participant handout to hold down some key ideas for that stage. So we're going to rotate through about two minutes per. Um, if your trio is a quad, then I'll call time a little sooner than that so you can rotate more quickly. So we'll go ahead with person one and launch, just sharing, again, a quick sketch of the, an overview of your stage and then how does it support effective implementation. <laughs> Okay, so great conversation there. We're going to upshift just a little bit, but we're going to stay in our trios. So we looked and we looked at the stages through the lens of how they support implementation. If we think about how they meet the needs of our teachers, um, and you can think about those instructional needs we know exist in our districts, but also the needs that teachers themselves have advocated for support around. So in your table teams, how might this sort of PL, the things that you saw across the stages, meet the needs of our teachers? So it's going to be an open forum conversation. Whoever feels ready um, can begin, and then it can just sort of go as it flows from there, making sure that everybody has an equitable opportunity to share. So we'll go ahead and take about three minutes. How might this PL meet the needs of our teachers? So keeping that, that same strand going, but coming a whole group now, what are we thinking? And you can share a, a thought you're having fresh in the moment, something you said during 
that trio discussion or, or something that a partner might have shared. Um, how might this sort of PL from, from your perspective meet the needs of our teachers? Perhaps even maybe better than the PL they've traditionally had access to. So what kind of things came out of your conversations or what, what kind of things are maybe in mind right now? My big takeaway was the part that they said, and I think it's good for teachers to feel this way, is they're going to actually, they're going to be uh, feeling what it feels like to be the actual learner. And that's going to help them allow, you know, sometimes we tend to lose patience with kids that maybe don't get it the first time, but they're not going to know all of this. They're going to be vulnerable. Yes, yes. And students are vulnerable. That's why a lot of them don't speak up. And hopefully it's going to take that away. That's, yeah, I think that's a powerful insight. Thank you. And the vulnerability of that, if, if that sort of safety and security isn't yet present in our PLCs, you know, how do we help teachers feel comfortable being vulnerable as they also experience that student side? I think traditional professional learning that most of us have been in puts things on teachers' plates. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're going to leave here and this is what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. Whereas this type of professional learning, you guys, takes things off. Like, I come away with having something done, like I've done something and I actually feel more prepared and less on my plate and more prepared to enter my classroom. That, that's a great point. And those of us who've, you know, who've spent time working with teachers, I mean, they're killing themselves night and day. And if you catch one in the hallway, they seldom feel really, truly as prepared as they would like for the class that's getting ready to happen. And so, I, yeah, I can see that very much so. I just think the ongoing support, you know, and I think in school climate too, that will have an impact on teachers' feelings toward admin, just knowing that there's, they're going to be supported weekly. Possibly, yes. You know. Absolutely. Um, oh, you might, we might be ready to say the same thing. Let's see. You say it and I'll, I'll affirm. I was just going to say, and we're seeing both here in Kentucky and nationally how this is helping with teachers. <coughs> we know that there is this shortage going on, but when teachers feel this supported in their profession, they have the resources, they're not spending all this outside time, and the PL is focused on helping them use the resources, they're staying in the profession instead of leaving. I would say that we're seeing nationally and in Kentucky, but, but a little bit differently, um, the, the critical role of, of leadership, especially building leadership, um, being instructionally involved in this work, which takes some vulnerability on their part as well, but the importance of, of principals and, and district leadership really like stepping in and being active participants as they're able in this process and, and sort of going arm in arm with the teachers is, is huge. <laughs> Any other thoughts before we transition? Okay. So we get to head back toward our home tables now. It's going to be kind of a quick break, so we're going to reconvene in about five. Maybe still out, but we've got something of a gradual on-ramp back in. So I mentioned that the excerpts we had for the stages were excerpts and that we would get to the stages in a more complete way in a moment. Um, and what's left are the key questions and key tools. So beyond the description and the PL experiences for each stage, you're going to see um, several sets of key questions and then key tools. We'll talk about those briefly before we get a chance to actually look at two key tools. So the purpose of the key questions, um, they build out a little bit what's available in the description. So they, they offer maybe a little bit extra information or an additional insight. They also take some of the things of the stage and pose them almost like problems of practice, which can make them a little bit easier maybe to engage and lean into. So you're going to notice across the stages there's some common categorization. So there's going to be a set of planning consideration questions. What are the things we need to think about when we're planning for CBPL experiences for this stage? There are system and structural considerations. So what are the questions we need to think about when we're trying to figure out how do we optimize our system and structures back in our district to really accommodate curriculum-based professional learning? And then measuring impact considerations. And those are the think abouts around how are we, how are we making sure the professional learning we're offering is effective um, at the level of supporting implementation, but also meeting the needs of our teachers. So with the key questions are key tools. 
Um, and they're really intended as you're going about the, the PL actions of the stage and you're taking up those key questions to meet you there and equip you with what you need um, to act on them. So the key tools are organized as well across the stages. So you're going to see system and support tools. Those are the tools that are going to help you, again, optimizing the local context for um, accommodating CVPL. Foundational PLC protocols, and these are the tools that build the core capacities that teachers are going to need um, to implement effectively um, and also to grow teacher practice. And then additional PLC protocols. So if the foundational ones really are going to get established in early implementation, even as they continue beyond there, the additional PLC protocols would come online as you move into ongoing implementation and that foundation is established to really continue to build out and deepen teachers' understandings and skills. <laughs> so we're going to get a chance to look at two tools in a moment, but I'll say first that it, it's probably helpful to, to reset the typical order of operation. So making sense at the unit level and unit internalization and getting that broader context, that would then inform lesson internalization and making sense at the lesson level, which is going to inform when it comes to lesson rehearsal, what are those key instructional moves that we want to practice within the safety and with the feedback of our PLCs. Um, we're going to stay just at the lesson level today so we can see the interplay of lesson internalization and lesson rehearsal. For lesson internalization, it'll also give us a sense of internalization more generally that, you, that would kind of hold up, hold up for unit internalization also. Um, and then for lesson rehearsal, we'll get a sense of how does having a chance to practice those key instructional moves with feedback from our colleagues, what does that do for the quality of instruction um, and for teacher efficacy? So, we're going to um, look at unit internal or lesson internalization first and then lesson rehearsal. You'll notice the handouts that you have for those two. Um, for lesson internalization, it's reading and writing. There is also lesson internalization available for math and for science, but today we're just going to stay in that reading and writing um, vein. So if you will, go ahead and, and marking up on those two handouts, um, really think about how might teachers engaging in these two protocols help support high quality instruction for all of our students. So we're going to annotate again directly on them, really thinking about if teachers are regularly engaging in lesson internalization and lesson rehearsal, how might that support access to high quality instruction for all of our students? We'll take about six minutes to work through those two protocols. As you're ready in your table teams, just take up that question and share thoughts now. How might engaging in these protocols support high quality instruction for all of our students? So in your table teams, go ahead and take that up now. Again, it's an open conversation, so uh, whoever feels ready can begin and just try to make sure everybody has a chance to speak. So we'll take about four minutes here. <clears throat> Whole group now. When we take on these ideas of internalization, and rehearsal, um, how does that compare maybe to the, the lesson planning that teachers have traditionally done? Um, what are some important similarities and maybe what are some important differences? So as we take on these ideas of internalization and rehearsal, how does that compare similarities and differences that might be important to the lesson planning teachers have traditionally done? Lesson planning is traditionally yeah. so low. Traditionally solo, absolutely. Whereas, I mean, realistically, you can sort of put yourself through these paces solo, if, and that might be helpful if, if you don't have access to your PLC at the time. But ideally, there's regular collaboration. Yes. I think as we move from planning everything to prepping the HQR, that's very different. So they've always internalized. When I'm planning something, I'm internalizing it as I go. <laughs> yes. But I think a huge misconception is I'm given an HQR and I think I don't have, I just walk in and teach. No, it still has to be internalized. So I think that might be what a lot of us are missing too, is teachers really sitting down with that lesson and making it, you know. Yeah. It's action prior to teaching. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And if you're trying to find things and then cobble them together or design them yourself and then internalize that enough to sort of be ready, the time to actually rehearse or practice anything is probably almost impossible to come by. But if those pressures are off of you, there's, there could be really a chance to 
Yes. And I think within a lot of the HQIR, there's just there's a cadence to the lessons. They are I don't want to say scripted, but even from if you look from K to five and then several of them, there's just a systematic approach for explicit instruction during the lesson. And the um, literacy vision, if the teachers have that, I, I'm, I'm just trying to wrap my head around yes. all of this. If the teachers have a clear literacy vision and focus, then just picking those parts of the lessons. And then it becomes, this is why we're doing it. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Drilling deep into how we're going to explicitly teach using this tool to meet the standard. Absolutely. A um, couple of things you could say there. So we know for students and for teachers, having having a familiar rhythm to what we're doing and routines that we're drawing upon can be helpful. Um, if you have that instructional vision or literacy vision, a couple of the nice things that can do, it can really help the resource. Seems like this is something we've brought in to help us do what matters to us. So it can help with that ownership piece, but also it can allow you to, I mean, this is a big protocol and you probably saw in the bold print, you wouldn't be able to do the whole of this in a single PLC. So in early implementation, you really might just live in that initial understand section, um, really trying to get your head around just the bones of, of what's going on. Whereas as implementation unfolds, you might pick up different aspects of your vision or whatever your PL focuses are to really narrow in. All right, now we're really going to think about this aspect of the lesson um, and maybe these instructional moves to rehearse. Absolutely. I think after school district, we had to revisit PLCs. Truly have not been doing effective PLCs. And so getting retrained in that um, as, at the same time while we we're trying to implement that you know new program I think that's really helped is really figuring out what's essential and that has helped them kind of through this process a little bit. I mean PLCs are vital I mean they really are the vehicle that carries this work along absolutely and Misty I think is gonna that's that's sort of PLCs or her passion project so she'll speak to that a little bit more here in, in, in a minute absolutely any other thoughts before we transition there's just so much power from going from an individualized island to a community, and so it becomes an equalizer for your school and your districts. Do you want to share about um, our teacher from Powell County? Oh, yeah. We had um, a group from Powell County, one of our pilot districts, sharing in, um, I don't even know now what meeting we were in. We've had a lot this month. But one of the things they were sharing with district leaders, they had a young teacher. So it was her second year teaching, first year at the elementary level. And she said because they had an HQIR when she came in, she felt like she was on a level playing field with her peers. She wasn't dependent upon them to maybe share a Google folder of where they had all of their stuff, but no one explaining anything to her about what was in it. They were all in it together, and they were figuring it out for all their kids. It wasn't my kids, your kids. It's like, it's the third grade kid. How are we helping the third grade kid? So just a big mind shift in his mind. Yeah, that's huge. Okay, so individual synthesis time. We're, we're on page two of the participant handout. So having thought about curriculum-based professional learning as it supports implementation, as it address, addresses those instructional needs we have in our districts, and as it supports our teacher around the needs they've expressed uh, a desire for support around, what's top of mind for you? So on page two of your participant handout, just quick note to self, having gotten into CBPL a little bit, What's maybe a thought you want to hold on to? Or a question? As some are finishing up, I'll go ahead and, and layer on. So moving forward, our recommendation would be um, to maybe use the guidance document to help build a sense back in district of what CBPL is, why it matters, how it fit, what it, what it has on offer for our teachers and leaders. Um, 
Another thing you might do as you think about these PL experiences for whatever stage of implementation you might be in, what are the particular protocols that we're going to use um, to, to calibrate those experiences? And our recommendation, and again, you'll probably hear this nationally as well, if you have a unit or lesson internalization or lesson rehearsal that's provided by your HQIR vendor, that might be a first choice because it's going to be specific to your resource, even though they all kind of draw on common national models. Um, we have these resources available as well um, in the guidance document. Um, and those are, again, from national models, but also specified to our Kentucky context and what's unique in our standards. So even if you have a vendor provided, it might be good to look at ours just to Kentuckyify it a little bit. Um, a third option would be if you're working with an HQPL provider or another outside vendor, they often have these tools as well. The caveat would be um, they're not going to be specific to your resource and they're not going to be specific um, to our standards and our context, so you would need to do um, probably a little bit of tuning up. I want to revisit kind of where we've been today for just a moment. So we started with looking at the curriculum implementation framework and what are the key responsibilities by role group across the stages. And we saw that one of those key responsibilities is about uh, providing and engaging in curriculum-based professional learning. So then we went into the guidance document to get a better understanding of what is curriculum-based professional learning, what are the PL experiences needed. So we've looked a lot at the what, but not necessarily the how. And so that's what we want to look at now is what is a way that you might structure for curriculum based professional learning at the local level. And one point I do think it's that we kind of are all recognizing I'm sure that it's important to make is that we are in the middle of a changing landscape in education in terms of a few years ago it was all about creating curating on your own we all had our own little things going on in our classrooms to this idea of using an hqir that is very different from like basils of old those are not what hqirs uh, are and so it's really a shifting landscape but because we have this shifting landscape in what teachers are doing and using, it's going to require a shift in the PL landscape as well. And you saw some of that in the video, but what you're going to see here, even in this model, it's probably going to look different than what you might have seen before in terms of how you've approached PL in the past. So one of the things we did is when we created the curriculum based professional learning guidance document, we took a draft of that to what we call our quality curriculum task force made up of different stakeholders from around the state. Anything we create out of our work, we send to them, we meet with them for review and feedback. They really liked what was in the guidance document, but one of the things they did say to us is, well, what does this actually look like in a district? They felt like people would need to see a model of how they might structure CDPL. So we started looking at the research around models. We were able to spend a few days with the Charleston, South Carolina or school district looking at the model that they use um, in partnership with leading educators with amazing student results that they are seeing. And so we also reached out to the national partners that helped us create the guidance document and they pointed to a similar model to what we saw in Charleston. So we used that model as our starting point and then adapted it for a Kentucky context. One thing I do want to uh, make note of here is it's a forward looking model. So please know that we recognize districts in Kentucky are likely not doing professional learning in this way. It's just kind of looking ahead to that changing landscape and what might be a way you could structure this at the local level. So as we go through this, I want you thinking about what are some of the elements you see that are similar to how you're approaching PL now in your district and what are maybe some of those shifts that you would see that might need to be made to really put this kind of approach in place. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So I said the last resource you need is that structuring professional learning cycles. And what you're going to see here on this slide, it's figure 1.1 in the resource. This is just one possible way that a district might structure their curriculum based professional learning into what we refer to as coherent quarterly learning cycles. So when we say quarterly, we're thinking about nine weeks. So you would have four of these cycles over the course of a school year. So I want to give you a moment just to look at the figure on the slide or at figure 1.1 in your handout, just to get a little bit of a sense of what is making up this cycle.
We have a lot of districts as we have gone around the state, they have said, well, we have a shell of something like this in place. It's just with more intentionality here, really around that curriculum-based professional learning piece. So I'm gonna Dana White here for just a moment. So a quarterly cycle would start with the sharing and processing of information to build a common understanding around an area of focus that has arisen as a need out of the use of the HQIR. Then educators would have time to internalize and practice key knowledge, skills, and understandings around that area of focus within their PLCs throughout that quarter. They would also have opportunity in PLCs to uh, analyze uh, data that they're looking at and to reflect to determine next steps. And each quarterly cycle would end with a more formal system-wide reflection of where are we around this area of focus and what might be our next steps. But because we recognize this is very new, we want to give you an opportunity to read more into the descriptions of each component. So this is your last reading for our time together today. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. As you read starting below figure 1.1 through like the middle of page two, for each component that makes up a quarterly cycle, I would like for you to annotate for three things. What is the setting or the PL structure in which that would occur? So like a workshop, a PLC. What is the purpose, the role that it plays in the cycle? And then finally, what's the cadence or the frequency at which that would occur in a cycle? So I'm gonna pause now and give you time to read and again, annotate each of the components for those three things. And again, when you get to that new section toward the middle bottom of page two, that's where you can stop. And here's what I would like for you all to do now. You're going to have a team discussion, and what I would like for you to do is to discuss the components in order. And for each component, just make sure you have a shared understanding of what was the structure, what's the purpose, and then what's the cadence of how often that would happen in a quarterly cycle. So have that conversation now. And so. What I would like to do now, and this is in the resource, but I'm gonna be speaking to it from the slide. You can also look at it in your resource um, if it's easier to look at it there. But I wanna show you just some examples of what this might actually look like, like how it might play out. And so I want us, we have examples for early implementation and then for um, ongoing. What we have learned from our pilot districts is that uh, early implementation is its own beast. I mean, that first year of using the resource is gonna be unlike the later years of using it. Because the focus of early implementation or year one really should be to build the initial familiarity of the resource overall at the unit level and at the lesson level. So that can help you determine the focus of your quarterly cycle. So as you can see from the example up here on the slide, and again, it's in your resource, this first shared learning session would be all about building an understanding of the design of the resource, how it's put together, the scope and sequence, how standards are being addressed throughout, then looking at how those are reflected at the unit level. This is actually your launch professional learning. It most likely would happen in the summer just before the start of the school year, that particular shared learning session. Then this is also when you would introduce unit internalization because that's gonna be the core process that's going to help them in their PL cycles to develop understanding of the units as they come to them. And then with the second uh, learning focus, that would be where you would start to introduce lesson level internalization. So now how are these design elements reflected in the lesson that could introduce lesson internalization? They would still keep doing unit internalization, throughout the year as each new unit of instruction would come up, but now they're just also taking some key lessons within that unit to also internalize those together. Then you could layer in later, looking at that lesson rehearsal, because now we've got a better sense of it, maybe we're ready to practice some key things around it, and then finally, it would be around that student work analysis. Like we understand things enough now, let's start to really uh, look at what the students are doing, what is their student work analysis showing. 
One thing we have found is that this right here is extending into year two. Fox mentioned that earlier. You're probably not gonna get these over the course of just the first year. You might have this last one actually feed into year two, and that is okay. One of the messages we really would like for people to take away that we've seen just in the research and we've seen from talking with other districts and states is that it is okay to slow down in early implementation, and you're going to have to allow your educators some grace as they're likely to feel like they're at the bottom of the learning curve again. Being asked to teach in a way they maybe have never taught before, Michael Fullen, in a lot of his work around curriculum implementation and really making system level changes of that magnitude, he says that in the beginning, when you take on something like this, everyone across the system is instantly de-skilled from your leaders and how they support it, to the teachers implementing it, to the students experience this kind of shift in what's happening in the classroom setting. So year one is really about supporting your teachers as they uh, use the resource consistently and with integrity and begin to make some of those foundational instructional shifts. So that's year one early implementation and how those cycles might play out. So I want to show you an example of what it could look like in ongoing. And again, in your resource, you have a reading and writing example that's like the one on the slide. You also have a math example. One thing I do want to point out is that from this example, we are not saying that these should be your areas of focus. That's not what we're saying at all. It's just meant to be an example. What should determine the area of focus when you get into ongoing implementation, it should be coming from multiple data sources. So what are teachers saying that they need the most help with? What are learning walks when we're looking at like an instructional practice guide or whatever our observation tool is? What is it showing us where teachers are struggling as well as analysis of student work? And one of the things I think that you're gonna find, what will often become an area of focus, it's going to be related to an instructional shift that's built into the design of the resource that teachers are probably struggling to make because they haven't taught that way before. So you'll see that connection there. One of the things that we wanted to show with these examples is that you also might find that an area of focus is going to be broad enough, it might go over across the whole year as you look at related aspects or go deeper on it over time. So we hope you, you kind of see that connection as well. And one other thing that I would say here in looking at this example, so what we would say would happen is they have that shared learning around whatever that area of focus is, is now in ongoing. They're looking at refining use of the resource over time. Then when they get into the lesson internalization and rehearsal, it's through the lens of that area of focus. So what will often happen is they would likely be able to internalize a key lesson through the area of focus and practice some element around that area of focus in the same PLC. Then the next week, or then they're all gonna go and teach that lesson, and then in their next week PLC, they're gonna bring back student data from the lesson that they all internalized and practiced together to look at what does that mean, how can that inform our next steps. So you would see that kind of iterative cycle happening. We started today talking about coherence, instructional coherence. So one thing I would add to this, not only should there be coherence in what the teachers are doing within their PLCs, but this should also extend up to leadership as well. So with leadership, when you're doing learning walks, when you're doing classroom observations, it should be through the lens of whatever the area of focus is during that particular quarter. So it's not all these different things happening to teachers, it's we're all really figuring out how to strengthen this particular area in this particular quarter. So there would be coherence in that as well. So one question I would like for you to think about, Knowing that this is forward looking, knowing that this may not be an approach that you've used before, just being honest in thinking about, well, what are some of the significant demands that this might place on the existing systems and structures back in your district? So what are things that have to be repurposed? Maybe what would be things that need to shift? Or what is maybe even a piece that's not even there right now we would think about adding in? So just wanna give you time to have that conversation at your table. So what are some of the demands that are coming to mind when you think about putting something like this model in place? So when you're ready, have that conversation at your table. And then just a little bit of some whole group share out. Um, again, 
what did you all talk about might be some of the demands that this would make on systems and structures back in your district? What were some of the things you all talked about? One of the things that I said is before you could ever even get to the classroom level, the instructional level with the teachers, you, know, you have school level leadership and district level leadership that they didn't learn under this model yes. either, yet they're the ones that are going to have to support that learning to have that uh, impact on instruction. So if they're not comfortable with the yep. model, they're not fluent in it and can't explain it, but, you know, provide the why, yes. then it's dead in the water. And it's so interesting, when we were at Learning Forward, we were in a session with a district talking about their approach. Um, they did a similar kind of model, but one of the things they said, we started with leadership. And what we actually had were people come in and model, and they actually had teachers come in and model lessons for leadership. So they understood what they were looking for and the kinds of instructional shifts. So they started building that with leaders first, just like you were saying. Yep, and they've had amazing results as well. Other demands that you all kind of noted. I heard that one. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and I heard time come up a lot of places, and we also recognize, and we'll, we'll say we don't have all the answers to this, elementary is the biggest challenge. Um, that's probably the biggest challenge, you know, because you might have to prioritize what is your data showing is the area that most needs support right now, and we're going to focus just in that area first. And one of the things that I do think we all can hopefully recognize today is that even if you focused on this just in one content area, it's going to transfer to other content areas, like as they're really internalizing and thinking in this way. So just thinking about where do we most need to start at the elementary level, knowing we could not put this in place from the beginning for every content area. Especially in elementary, um, wisely like uh, staggering adoption and implementation yes. so that you have one content area, you're able to do work like this, get acclimated, and then a second coming in. Because you're trying to implement two content areas at the same time for a self-contained teacher. Yeah. Okay. So one of the last things we want to do, again, is give you an opportunity to just jot down what is top of mind for you right now, most important to remember, around this idea of quarterly PL cycles. So take just a moment, very bottom of page two of your participant handout, what's important for you to remember coming back to this later? As you are finishing that up, the last recommendation of the day that we would offer to you around this idea of the quarterly PL cycles is really start to think about what are the structures that already exist that are assets back in your district that you could capitalize on to help put this in place? And then what are some things that might need to shift? And even thinking about the biggest idea here is the PL cycle. It Maybe you don't start with quarterly, but again, it's getting that cycle in place of those key elements, those key components, knowing you want to work toward eventually having the quarterly PL cycles. So a couple of things that I would offer here. One is I think it might be helpful around this to go back and take stock of what are all of the existing blocks of PL time we have in our calendar. So do we have early release days? How are we using our district PD days? Even being creative and thinking about some use of certain, like some of your faculty meetings, how might those maybe be repurposed in some creative ways? So I think that could be helpful because once you have an idea of these are all the blocks of PL time we have, you could think how you might repurpose some of those to uh, allow for this type of an approach. The, uh, the other thing that I would say um, before coming to KDE the district that I was in again deep work around PLCs and so it might be helpful for you all to think about um, and take stock of what's the current work happening in our PLCs and is there anything we need to clean up or clean out of that PLC time to allow for the PL experiences that we have talked about today um, because in the work around PLCs we know that they're all about answering 
four driving questions. That should be at the heart of the work of the PLC. What do we want students, or students to know and be able to do? How are we going to know if they've learned it? What will we do for those who didn't? How do we extend for those who did? The thing that makes an HQIR an HQIR, it often has the answers built into it. But teachers need time and space to make sense of all that's in there to meet the needs of the students sitting in front of them right then. And so looking at the PL experiences we've talked about today and those core processes of like internalization and rehearsal tightly aligns to the purpose of a PLC. So I really think that's key to getting this up and running well is strengthening what's happening within your PLCs. So we've had little micro refle reflections distributed throughout today. We're going to do one final reflection um, just with a partner. So we have our learning frame for the day up here if you want to quickly take a look back at our session goal and where we've touched down in those two sections. <clears throat> And then for the reflection, we've got quite a few different angles that you can take. So you can sort of go in the directions that call to you. So um, first, you might consider, how has this session expanded your sense of effective implementation, you know, sort of generally speaking? And that, of course, includes the professional learning associated with effective implementation. How can effective curriculum implementation positively impact the quality of instruction, student experiences, and student outcomes, a variation on that same theme? Um, and then just more general and maybe more personal, um, what might a next step be for you um, as a result of your learning today? Um, and again, you're not bound to these, just a, just a possible next step. So um, playing off again, whichever parts of that speak to you. And let's start with once you have your partner with the partner farthest from me. So we'll take about one minute um, and then I'll call time and we'll shift to the other partner. So whichever partner in your pair is farthest from me, take about one minute and again, you can work off of those any way you like. <clears throat> And, and we acknowledge this is a lot to take in. You probably feel like your hat size has grown by an inch today. I mean, this is a lot to take in. So uh, you'll have access to the resources and materials and, and other ways of continuing to get your heads around it as we go. Uh, next, the Kentucky Reads to Succeed conference um, is coming up June 20th. You can see some of the strands there, all supporting literacy in Kentucky. It's free to Kentucky educators. You'll have folks from the Office of Teaching and Learning at KDE um, and some of our partners, including um, Misty and I will both be there. Registration information is coming soon, probably through the regular channels. And if we have any fans of the Soul to Story podcast, Emily Hanford is going to be doing the keynote there. So just watch for that registration information. And as I get ready to hand it off to Crystal with a standards update, I just would like to thank you all for your time, attention, and participation during our segment today. Again, the resources are there. Oh, <laughs> and uh, please feel free to reach out with questions, um, with needs for support. As implementation goes well back in your districts and you want to share high points, please feel free to reach out. Thank you for your time this morning and focus. We know that it's a lot to process, and each school and district is very different. You have different structures and different assets to really tap into to do this work. And so we appreciate your thinking. But we do know that it's so critical, the resources and the professional learning for teachers is so critical in bringing standards to life in the classroom. So we did want to make sure we prioritize that time for you today to really look deeply at those resources. We do have a few updates to share with you today around standards. Um, the biggest one is around our Kentucky Academic Standards for Science. So it was formally adopted into law in July of 2023, and it's tentatively scheduled to be on the operational Kentucky Summative in the spring of 2026. I know as a former instructional coach, that was a day that I always wanted to have in mind as I think about implementation of the standards in the classrooms. I will say if you have any specific assessment questions, um, you can email those to dacinfo at, at education.ky.gov and they'll have more specific information, but at this time this is the tentative um, date for that to be on the operational assessment. So this is a good opportunity to harken back to our strengthening tier one instruction um, graphic, understanding the importance of these key components and bringing standards to life for students 
it's a great time to revisit that in the context of science. So thinking through instructional visioning, your resources, your local curriculum document, and the professional learning to support teachers in implementation. So last year we were talking about the, the upcoming changes to the science standards and we highlighted the um, science Impl implementation guide. It's your one-stop shop, sort of a catalog of resources that we have to support implementation of science. I do want to lift up a few of the things that are within that document that might be of interest to you. So this current year is a really great time to explore the standards and what's changed with the, the revised version. And so the standards at a glance document, it's a front to back one pager and it updates your teachers, your administrators on what exactly changed from legacy standards to the new standards. The getting to know the cast for science module, that is a professional learning experience that gives a more comprehensive overview of the science standards um, and what you would see in the classroom with that. And we have updated our standards family guides in English and in Spanish. So that's an important piece is letting families know what to expect in each of the content areas and those align with the updated standards as well. Thinking into next year, you're going to be thinking about early standards implementation. So teachers will be looking for what's different, making changes to their local curriculum document to incorporate those new standards into their instruction. This is a great time to revisit the curriculum development process if you haven't gone through that process for science. So we have the curriculum development process that will lead you through setting your instructional vision, evaluating and selecting materials if you need um, high quality instructional resources for science if you don't already have those, and working on developing your local curriculum document and updating that. A couple of resources I want to highlight for that phase of implementation are really the phenomena for instruction and the three-dimensional tasks modules. They'll help your teachers to, and anyone that's really working on that instructional visioning, understand what the student experience should look like and feel like um, in the classroom. So that's a great support there. Now we know when it comes to evaluating and selecting instructional resources for science that the market isn't quite there yet. It is rapidly evolving. Um, typically, we point to ed reports um, for their comprehensive review of instructional resources for high quality, and they have a robust catalog of reviewed resources for reading and writing and mathematics, and they have begun that for science. So we know as you look at specific grade levels uh, or grade bands, there aren't as many that have been reviewed yet. They are rapidly coming out with new reports um, each month, um, but we know that the, it's not as robust as it is for the other content areas. So we have created the Science Instructional Resources Consumer Guide. This came out early this month. This is similar to the Consumer Guide for Reading and Writing in Mathematics, except it has very specific markers for science in looking at resources. And again, thinking about that limited market for reviewed science resources, our consumer guide for science includes a considerations document that will help to support you in decision making when it comes to looking for resources that may not have gone through the review process completely with ed reports. <clears throat> and I want to hand it over now to Eric and Amanda to share um, one of their resources that is just recently released as well. Yeah, thank you, Crystal. So we wanted to share with you a new professional uh, learning module that Amanda and I have developed that very tightly aligns to many of the, um, much of the information that you have received from Ms. DM Fox today regarding curriculum-based professional <laughs> learning. And this is our improving student engagement in the science classroom using a driving question board. Some of the key features that you will see within this professional learning module Driving Question Board is a very highly effective strategy that is found in most um, high quality instructional resources, such as Open Syed and many of the others that you will find on Ed Reports. We utilize a resource within this professional learning module uh, to provide the participants with that curriculum based experience where they actually put themselves in the role as an adult learner as well as being able to reflect as a teacher. So Amanda will tell you a little bit more about that. 
So as you're hearing that word driving question board, you might be thinking, you know, well, what is that? And so this is one of our shared common definitions that we begin exploring within this module, that a driving question board is a jointly constructed visual representation of a class shared mission of learning. It's a place for all students to record their questions about the anchoring phenomenon or problem used to drive the classroom instruction. And this actually is a student example that comes from an open educational resource that we elevate and use within the module. So currently right now, we just completed last night a webinar where we took some pre-service teachers, K through 12 teachers, teacher leaders, one of your very own, Dr. Susan Beatty, has been also participating and participated in our webinar, um, going through the, this, these mod, this module. And it was uh, comprised of four sessions in which we met. And as you can see with the graphic on the right, these are some essential components that we considered when teachers are trying to implement a driving question board in the classroom. And our goals from the module, as you can see, is that we hope that the outcomes that they have through going through them is that they can explain what a driving question board is and understand its purpose in the science classroom, identify the ways that a driving question board can build that community of learners, analyze how a cohesive storyline can be built around an anchoring phenomenon, and then generate ideas for how a driving question board can be used as a formative assessment tool. Our information is up on the slide. If you guys have any questions and would like to talk to us more about this particular module or others that we can provide, um, or if you have any questions about revolving around the science standards, please feel free to, to reach out to either one of us. So a couple other standards updates. The standards for visual and performing arts. We have a draft that is currently out for public comment. Um, that public comment period ends April the 4th. So if you have any visual performing arts teachers that you would love to have some input in their standards, now's a great time to elevate that to them. Uh, the plan is that those standards will then go forth to the Kentucky Board of Education in June of 2024 after our standards writers have addressed the feedback from the public and then it'll begin that legislative process. So legislative process takes anywhere from six to nine months. So it could be December um, through March of next year before those are finally adopted into law. Additionally, our health education and physical education standards documents are open for review. They were out for public comment in the fall, and we have our committees, our teacher committees, working on addressing the public feedback and making recommended changes to those standards documents. I want to thank you for your time and, um, and focus today. Our information is up here on the screen. If you have any questions, once you go back to your schools and districts, um, feel free to reach out to us. We'll be around um, to answer any questions that you may have uh, while we're here in person with you.